Hi, my name's Rob Mackay. I'm a reader in uh, composition and sonic arts at the University of Hull and uh, soon to be a 100% uh, independent researcher and uh, interdisciplinary artist. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about the project Following the Flight of the Monarchs and I'm just going to bring up the slideshow for you here and share computer audio. So the project is an interdisciplinary acoustic ecology project, um, bringing together artists and scientists um, across the migratory routes of monarch butterflies who perform this incredible 3000 mile journey between uh, Canada and Mexico every year. There are actually four generations a year Generation one starts uh, in Texas um, around about April um, and um, or end of March, beginning of April. And then generation two flies um, up to the north of um, the United States and they start to sort of propagate across um, the states. And then generation three gets into Canada. Um, and then it's generation four, which um, does this uh, amazing journey. Uh, they only take about six weeks um, just after the um, equinox uh, in um, September, they start to make this uh, journey south um, and they start arriving in Mexico in around uh, November. Um, the, there's the, the life cycle from uh, the egg, um, the larvae um, eat um, exclusively milkweed. It's the only plant that they eat. Um, and we'll get onto that in uh, a little bit later in the uh, discussion. Um, and then through to the rather beautiful looking adult. Um, this is uh, one of the pupae. I just think they're amazing. That sort of gold seam, um, really quite beautiful. And uh, so this is uh, the uh, sort of fall migration. Uh, the autumn migration, um, uh, the majority of the monarch butterflies fly down the eastern seaboard, uh, sort of from Canada through Virginia, etc. Uh, and then they all sort of funnel down through Texas and then down into Mexico. There are um, also, uh, there's a kind of a smaller uh, population of monarch butterflies that migrate up and down the west coast, um, sort of between sort of northern and southern California as well. Um, so the journey with monarch butterflies for me began in 2015. Um, I was actually um, invited to CMAS, which is the Mexican Center for Music and Sonic Art and Arts in Mexico, uh, in uh, Morelia, uh, which is about a uh, four hours drive west of Mexico City. Um, and I was invited to give a solo concert and uh, talk there. Um, and I was talking to an ecologist friend of mine and he said, oh, you're going to Michoacan. I'm sure that that's, that's, that's where the uh, monarch butterflies migrate to. I didn't really know anything about them um, and um, told me about this incredible migration. And it, it had just so happened that I was going to be there at the time that the monarchs were overwintering in these vast numbers in Mexico. Um, I thought, uh, that would be a really interesting thing to see. And I did a little bit of research and discovered that because they swarm in millions, you can actually hear this beautiful rushing sound of their wings. And as a sound artist, I was fascinated by trying to capture this sound. Um, so I only had one day uh, to do it and I was lucky enough that there was enough sun on that day because the monarch butterflies uh, metabolisms are very uh, temperature dependent and they can only uh, fly when they've warmed up enough in direct sunlight. Um, and I was able to uh, record and film them. Um, and then I kind of sat on that material for about a year um, and I was then asked to uh, create um, an installation based around flight for the Amy Johnson Festival in Hull, uh, celebrating the amazing aviatrix um, from Hull, who um, was the first person actually to perform a solo flight between um, uh, the UK and Australia. Um, and I, I, it was really an opportunity, I think, to use this material. Um, so uh, in the end, um, I created this kind of hide-like structure 
um, Alex Brook um, at the University of Hull, a theatre set designer, um, made my ideas into a reality. Um, and there are four video screens, uh, one above you as well, um, where I filmed the monarchs sort of flying overhead in the canopy, and four loudspeakers. And the idea is that um, the uh, listener viewer walks into this hide, a bit like a, um, a hide in a forest where you'd be looking at birds and then in this case at uh, butterflies, and you are then transported to uh, southern Mexico. Um, and the sound layer, um, or well, there are actually three layers of sound to the installation as well. Uh, the first layer is field recordings, including that um, delicate rushing sound of the monarch butterfly's wings. There's also a specially commissioned poem from Mexican poet uh, Rolando Rodriguez, who um, I met um, after I'd actually recorded the, the, the butterflies, has a beautiful reading voice. And for me, it was really important to connect with um, people in the country um, and um, it's in um, in Spanish there's a, a sort of English translation uh, in text uh, that people um, in, in uh, the UK um, can can read when the the installation has been touring around um, and that is based on the scientific knowledge that we have about how the monarch butterflies uh, migrate um, but told from a very sort of uh, emotive perspective actually from the perspective of the butterflies themselves and then there's also um, the third layer of the sound is a musical improvisation between myself on flute uh, David Blink uh, a, a, a musician based in California um, who plays uh, both handpan and um, trumpet who's become a very much a, a, a sort of key um, partner in the project and also uh, John Sanders on accordion um, and I use this sort of musical layer to uh, fuse the other sonic layers together. Um, we ended up touring this installation around uh, the UK and other parts of the world. Uh, the top one there is actually at the Eden Project in Cornwall. Um, that was there for five days. Um, and then I think my most sort of favorite uh, presentation of uh, the installation was in the open air at the Shambhala festival um, so you're kind of walking in the woodlands and the English countryside and you walk inside the uh, hide and you're kind of teleported to um, Mexico uh, to view and hear the monarch butterflies. Um, those are all of the people who are involved um, in the project. I should also give credit to Jessica Rodriguez, who um, edited the video material that I uh, recorded, and Manuel Zarate, um, who did the video recording for the top panel and was also um, uh, uh, sort of helping me on that first day um, that I recorded and, and videoed the uh, monarchs. Uh, we've also presented it at New York Electroacoustic Music Festival, Music Port in Whitby. It's also been at the Eco Acoustics Congress in uh, Brisbane and uh, the International Computer Music Conference uh, in Korea. So that was the first stage of the project. Um, and really through uh, that experience, I learned more about the monarch butterflies, including the um, huge threats that they face. And really, they're very much an indicator species. Uh, they're not the only species that is uh, being affected by some of these uh, uh, sort of drastic changes in the environment. Um, but their, um, their numbers, their population has actually decreased by nearly 90% over the last 20 years. So a very short period of time. Um, and there are really three main factors that we think um, are um, causing this. Um, one of them is uh, sort of industrial use of herbicides, uh, particularly um, in the US along the Corn Belt. Um, and those herbicides sort of kill off everything apart from, uh, for example, genetically modified crops, uh, genetically modified corn, um, which has been uh, modified to withstand um, Roundup and, and other herbicides. And the problem with the herbicides, it kills sort of everything else, including the milkweed, which is the only food that the uh, monarch's larvae eat. So no milkweed, no monarch butterflies. But it's also affecting all kinds of other pollinating um, insects and, um, and as well. Um, so that's one factor. The other factor um, is deforestation, um, particular sort of um, issue in 
Mexico um, because uh, when the monarch butterflies migrate into Mexico, um, I was saying before that their uh, metabolism is very uh, temperature dependent um, and um, they actually only roost in the oyamel trees, which uh, only grow above 10,000 feet. So they're basically the sort of the, almost, well, the entire migratory population of monarch butterflies um, in the world is kind of squashed into the mountain peaks. If you looked at a, a map view, they're um, uh, very much sort of squashed into just a few kilometers. So again, that habitat is, is very sort of delicate. And um, these are mainly sort of rural areas. People have been logging there for generations, uh, form of, you know, for fuel, for, for, for livelihood. Um, but uh, since the 80s, when uh, that um, those sort of territories have become protected. Unfortunately, uh, sort of other means of um, making an income weren't really made sort of readily available. So logging is still a, a big issue um, there, in including sort of illegal logging. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, climate change, um, which is sort of affecting everything. Um, and particularly with the monarch butterflies, uh, there could, there's a sort of increasing rate of freak storms. And I was talking to Lincoln Brower, who was the world leading sort of authority on monarch butterflies um, about uh, two and a half years ago. And he's saying that there was, he remembers one time where he was walking through two feet deep of monarch butterflies. It's kind of like walking through autumn leaves, um, but it's just millions of, of dead butterflies. Um, so I wanted to see if I could use um, sound as a means of um, both raising awareness and also providing a useful data stream actually for um, scientists to use in environmental monitoring. Um, and certainly the field of ecoacoustics, uh, soundscape ecology, um, uh, is a sort of increasing um, area uh, that is being used um, in interdisciplinary uh, projects and, and sound and the sort of holistic approach to um, uh, looking at the relationship uh, of uh, sound uh, in an overall environment um, can be used for um, environmental monitoring. Um, so obviously we have uh, R. Murray Schaefer um, and um, the group of um, early acoustic ecologists, including Hildegard Westerkamp and Barry Truax, um, who started to use sound and listening as a means of gleaning information about our environment, and at the same time, viewing um, the soundscape as a kind of um, evolving composition. Um, and more recently, uh, the work of uh, Bernie Krauss and the area of eco-acoustics. Um, Bernie Krauss um, had a sort of a career as a musician, um, session musician, uh, played with bands like The Doors, and then um, got into electronic music. And he had this kind of epiphany moment um, when he was uh, commissioned to record some, uh, the soundscape of an island. Um, and he, he had this moment where he put my, uh, headphones on and was listening through the kind of lens of the microphone that he was suddenly opened up to this incredible, um, incredibly rich um, sonic uh, sort of landscape of that environment. Um, he also got into sound design for Hollywood movies. He did some of the sound design on Apocalypse Now. And then uh, he left all of that, I think, in his 40s and did a PhD in bioacoustics and started working for the Forestry Commission. And over the past 50 years, he's been recording um, environments um, all around the world. Um, and what he has found uh, within that, partly due to his sort of musical training, um, is that um, each uh, organism um, has sort of found its own acoustic niche within each uh, soundscape. So each organism sort of communicates across a narrow bandwidth of frequencies that doesn't overlap with other species. Um, he also has this sort of useful broad categories of sound, which are just useful for um, starting to analyze. So you have the biophony, which is all of the sounds in a, in a given uh, soundscape uh, created by um, organisms uh, which communicate through, through sound. Uh, you have the geophony, which is the sounds naturally occurring in an environment um, that aren't made by living things. So such as the wind through leaves or the sound of rain or um, waves 
or an earthquake, etc. Um, and then you have the anthropophony, uh, human-made sound. He's also worked a lot with the ecologist uh, Brian Pijanowski. Um, they've published quite a lot, including um, this uh, that citing here, Soundscape Ecology, the Science Sound in the, in the Landscape. Um, so this is a sonogram of a recording that uh, Bernie Krauss made in uh, Borneo, Camp Leakey. And here you can clearly see these different niches of sound. So um, uh, you have time from left to right, and then the more intense a particular frequency is, the brighter um, it is. So you have those insects with cicadas um, at the sort of top there, then two different species of birds, um, and then no ID, not sure what that was, and then some gibbons down at the bottom. Um, and so for me, one of the most sort of compelling um, sort of examples of how um, uh, sound was used as a means of um, uh, monitoring change in an environment is um, in Lincoln Meadow in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. Um, uh, this is a photograph in 1988 where Bernie Krauss went there six months before um, they were going to be performing uh, selective logging in the area. So selective logging rather than chopping down a whole swathe of trees, you chop down one or two here, here and there in a particular area. And the idea is that you're minimizing impact. Um, so he took a photograph six months before logging and also took a, uh, made a sound recording. He then went there six months after logging, took a photograph. It pretty much looked exactly the same as this one here, but sound told a very different story. So this is a sonogram six months before logging. You can see it's a very sort of rich um, acoustic um, environment there. Lots of different species communicating across different um, uh, frequency bands. And now six months after logging, you see it's a very different story. And in fact, this is just a lone woodpecker. And he's actually been back there, I think uh, over 15 times over the last 25 years or so, and it still hasn't recovered. Um, I think this is just a really sort of compelling example of how sound can reveal uh, certain things about the health of an ecosystem. Um, so I was really um, keen to uh, use some of the things that I've been sort of learning about um, ecoacoustics in my research over the last five or, or six years or so. Um, and uh, particularly with connecting with the idea of live streaming. So rather than going into an environment and recording uh, sort of uh, sound um, uh, samples at uh, different intervals, um, with live streaming, uh, with advice in a given environment, you can start to do sort of remote sensing and even longer term uh, monitoring if you have a large enough um, server uh, and perhaps uh, machine listening uh, techniques. Um, so um, uh, around the same time that I first went to uh, record the Monarch Butterflies, I went to a conference in Arizona um, and um, I met Grant Smith from the UK organization SoundCamp and they specialize in live streaming. Um, and they're actually uh, hosting a, a wonderful event called Reve um, this Saturday for um, International Dawn Chorus Day. They've been doing this for about the last five years. And uh, the first weekend in May is always uh, International Dawn Chorus Day. And for that, they basically follow the um, Dawn Chorus all the way around the world over 24 hours. So lots of different people have set up live streams on the Locus Sonus sound map. Um, I'll get onto that in, in a second. Um, and um, you can basically hear the live streams around the world. I'm also going to be giving, as part of that, a, uh, a Zoom presentation about this project, um, including listening into a, a number of live streams that we've actually set up across the migratory routes of monarch butterflies. Um, so this also connects with Leah Barclay's uh, UNESCO Biosphere um, uh, Soundscapes project, uh, which is actually using live streams um, as a means of environmental monitoring across UNESCO Biosphere reserves in different parts of the world. So this uh, fits into that because um, we uh, did a, our pilot project, the first stream box that we installed was in Mexico in Cerro Pallone, uh, the Cerro Pallone uh, Biosphere Reserve, which is a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. And as part of that, we were collaborating with the Butterflies and Their People Arborist Scheme. Um, and this is a scheme set up by um, Ellen Sharp and Joel Moreno. 
Um, and they basically provide paid roles in the region to uh, become stewards of the forest. So I was mentioning that logging is an issue there. Um, and actually, um, this, these are the first three uh, arborists. There are actually, I believe, six now. And you can uh, donate um, to that um, scheme to provide those paid roles to, um, for people to be stewards of the forest and a couple of them were previously loggers um, so they're now um, having an uh, employment which is helping to conserve that environment um, i was lucky enough to meet uh, lincoln brower um, the sort of world leading authority on monarch butterflies in 2017 and i interviewed him uh, he sadly passed away um, in the summer of 2018. Um, but I was talking to him about the possibility of using sound as a means of uh, monitoring the monarch's behavior as well as the overall uh, soundscape within the ecosystems that they um, inhabit um, across um, their migratory routes. So equally listening to uh, the different bird species and other insect species which make sound um, and, and so to see if we can monitor a change over time are there declines of certain bird species um, that some, some of the birds uh, in those environments are actually predators of the monarch butterflies but also I talked about that incredible rushing sound of the monarch's wings um, could we have for example microphones that are sensitive enough to be able to hear that and could we perhaps monitor their swarming behavior over time um, as i was saying before the monarchs um, uh, are very um, their metabolism is very temperature dependent and when they overwinter in mexico they huddle together in these sort of bunches under the trees that look like fruit almost and um, they're in these sort of um, blanketed um, canopies um, so that the, the, the trees provide some temperature protection for them and they huddle together to keep warm when the sun isn't shining and then when the sun does come out and once they've warmed up enough they then can fly down to a meadow all of the um, mountain environments they may inhabit have these uh, meadows as well which are open uh, grassland um, which are very good for capturing uh, dew and other sort of pockets of water so they'll go down there to drink and also to um, drink nectar from flowers um, and there's this kind of cloud forming that behavior that they have could we um, actually pick that up in sound and monitor how often um, they're doing that um, so i went to mexico um, and connected with the scientist um, uh, Pablo Jaramillo Lopez and also David Blink uh, came back as well. And um, this is a sound field microphone. Um, and hopefully there you can see uh, this wonderful swarming of the monarch butterflies. And I was picking up um, the sound of that rushing uh, with the um, microphone in 3D surround sound and the sonics. Um, so, like the Sierra Nevada example, um, this is um, a recording I made in the meadow uh, when the monarch butterflies weren't there. And now, when they are. Now I'm recording this uh, presentation via Zoom, um, so the sound quality isn't quite as high um, as the uh, original recordings, but hopefully you get an idea there and you could hear that rushing sound of the wings. Um, so those are the sort of recorded uh, examples, but at the same time, uh, in uh, the Sedapo Lone Reserve in uh, January 2018, when I made those recordings and did lots of filming, also brought with me a stream box which had been made by um, SoundCamp, uh, which is a Raspberry Pi computer 
uh, inside a weatherproof container, a couple of microphones, and we also um, took a, a couple of very heavy solar batteries and uh, solar panels, and it uh, connects via um, a 4G router to a mobile phone network to broadcast the sounds. What we're looking at here is a screenshot of the Locus Sonus sound map, which has been running since 2006, and it is run by uh, the University of Marseille. And all of those pins on the map you can see there are actually live um, audio feeds. Um, and actually anyone can sign up to it. It's completely open source. You can even use a mobile phone. They have a uh, an app called Locus Cast that um, uh, turns a mobile phone into a streaming device. You have a PD patch or other means of turning a laptop into a streaming device as well. Or you can go down the sort of Raspberry Pi route. There's, an, there's no sort of fixed way of doing this. Um, and it can be very sort of DIY. It doesn't have to cost the earth um, to, to make your own streaming station. Um, I'm just going to um, stop sharing this for a second because I want to bring up the live sound map now so this is uh, a tab on here whoops i thought i was on that stop sharing again share screen sorry yeah this is the sound map here so in 2018 i installed uh, that stream in mexico you can see it there and in September this year, I also installed a stream box at the Point Pelee uh, National Park in um, Leamington, Ontario. Um, I also took a stream box with me to Virginia. Um, it's yet to be uh, fully installed. Um, it's kind of been put on hold slightly due to the COVID-19 crisis, but I'm working with um, Kipta Peak State Park and the Coastal Virginia Wildlife Observatory and sound artist um, Vaughan Garland there and Vaughan will be live streaming uh, from his back garden, which is a Monarch Way station, um, this Saturday during my Zoom talk. Um, there's also um, a stream run by Joel Goodwin in Austin, Texas, and we're hoping to set up a, another box um, there uh, with Rebecca Quinones, who's um, a citizen scientist uh, a coordinator uh, for Monarch Butterflies. And we're also collaborating with uh, Trevor Herbert at Jasper Ridge um, uh, Wildlife um, Preserve and um, that is actually run um, as part of uh, Stanford University. So we can just uh, quickly listen to Point Pooley here. So uh, Point Pooley is this, uh, this knife edge peninsula that juts out into Lake Erie, one of the great lakes. Um, and it, a, a lot of the time it sounds like you can hear the surf, it's like being on the sea. But there's plenty of birds and insect activity there at the moment. Um, this is actually on the roof of their visitor's centre. And maybe I'll just play you a quick bit on Jasper Ridge as well. So the idea is that we're making this network of stream boxes um, across the uh, migratory uh, path of uh, the monarchs. Um, uh, bring up this one again. There we are. I just want to. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, so there's actually uh, sort of five uh, locations um, that we're installing the, the boxes um, at this stage. Um, and the idea is that those can be shared by scientists anywhere um, uh, or to, to anyone anywhere in the world, uh, both for um, sort of gathering um, scientific uh, data from the sound source, as well as um, raising awareness um, about the issues that the monarchs um, face. 
Um, so this is Franco Ramirez, who was helping us with, sort of find the right location for the internet signal. Um, and uh, we went up on horseback carrying these incredibly heavy uh, solar batteries. We also drove around to begin uh, with um, around the mountain to see if we could find the right locations. And these are our happy faces. Um, uh, for the first time, we managed to actually get the stream box streaming and appearing on the sound map. Um, this is uh, what the stream box looks like inside. So at the bottom there, you've got the Raspberry Pi computer. Uh, there was actually a Cirrus Logic um, sound card. We're now using Focusrite uh, Sapphire, or as I should say, uh, SoundCamp. So this design is by Grant Smith. Um, and there are two um, uh, omnidirectional microphones either side of the uh, stream box there. Um, and um, it kind of produces a binaural image. Um, so if you put headphones on, you really get a 3D immersive sense of being in the environment. Then you've got the solar battery at the top there and very much at the top uh, of the image on the right hand side, you've got the 4G router. Um, and we were searching around for the right signal. And finally, we found the right place which had enough sunlight, enough signal and was actually on the flight path of the Monarchs. Um, and this is it installed with the solar panel the box is off to the right that's what the scene looks like from the mountain um, and um, this is a list of the bird species that um, some ornithologists at UNAM the uh, Autonomous University of Mexico where Pablo works were able to identify from a short recording we made from the live stream which I'll play to you now So there's actually a couple of um, predators of the monarch butterflies that are there as well. Um, whilst we were at the reserve, we also recorded ourselves improvising um, in those environments. And we we're actually putting together a sort of DVD or online presentations of these performances. Uh, this is David Blink uh, playing hand pan among the monarch butterflies. You can see a lot of them on the ground there drinking the dew. Um, So uh, worked with Rolando Rodriguez with live uh, poetry recitations in the reserve as well. And there was, we had sort of different ensembles from solo to group improvisations. Um, very much sort of inspired by um, composer David Dunn. Um, with lots of compositions which sort of interact with the soundscape in real time. Uh, famously as Nexus One, which is the three uh, trumpets in um, uh, the Grand Canyon, uh, interacting with that incredible acoustic. Um, and actually the, the uh, meadow that we're in uh, had a, an incredible uh, re reverberance as well. Um, so this is myself on flute and David Blink um, playing trumpet. And you can hear all the reverb that you hear on here hasn't been added. It's the natural acoustic. Um,
interest of time, I suppose I should wrap everything up. So these are the um, five uh, initial locations that we're um, setting uh, stream boxes up in. Uh, and there's going to be an additional one in Northern California um, set up by David Link as well, sort of monitoring that smaller Western uh, migration. Um, one of the additional uh, things we want to do is to engage a lot of citizen scientists. And we're looking at using Dan Stoll's Warbler app, which identifies different bird species. So anyone can sort of listen to the stream, hold that app up to um, the feed and um, log the birds that they can hear. Um, this has been in the UK for a number of years, but there's actually now a North American version, which has a database of um, bird species there. Um, we also presented a kind of touring, we're creating a touring exhibition. This is um, the installation along with a touch screen, um, the live stream and um, a documentary about the um, uh, threats that the monarchs uh, face by um, an artist called uh, Anna Chahanyu, which is actually a, a biologist and artist. Um, and this is a presentation we gave at the British Science Festival um, at the University of Hull in 2018. Um, this is uh, an unfortunate monarch butterfly that got frozen um, in the meadow. Uh, the temperatures can vary because it's very high up in the mountains. So it can be freezing overnight and then really hot during the day. Um, I'm also making a 30 minute radio program for BBC Radio 3 for their Between the Ears series, collaborating with producer Andy King on that. It was due for broadcast in June this year, but that's been pushed back to the end of the year due to the COVID-19 um, situation. Uh, but do look out for that. We also have a website called followingtheflightofthemonarchs.com where you can follow updates. And just a reminder, I'm going to be giving another presentation uh, this Saturday at 2 p.m. via Zoom in live real time. So you can have a bit of uh, interaction on that. And um, we've also been doing network performances. So we use the sound map um, and uh, an online video uh, editor to do a telematic performance between myself. Uh, last time we did it was in um, Leeds. Uh, well, I was in Leeds um, in December uh, with uh, another fl flute player, um, Joel Goodwin. Um, and then we had David Blink playing uh, the handpan and trumpet in California. We had Rolando uh, reciting live poetry in Mexico. And we had uh, Jessica Rodriguez doing a live VJ um, set using um, film uh, footage from the uh, different uh, reserves along the route. And that was a half hour performance. So we're going to do a web version of that as well. So look out for that. Um, and thanks very much for listening. Um, uh, hopefully through Team Monarca we can make um, a bit of a difference. Thanks. I'll stop that. And if you have any questions, I'm uh, Rob Mackay on Facebook, or you can email me um, at uh, robflute2 at gmail.com. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>